Susan, we met at the um, AT&T Developer Conference, and mm -hmm. you were getting a lot of attention because you were using um, a 3D printer to create your create your presentation, your your object. Um, Tell us a little bit about what got you started in um, hackathons and interested in doing that kind of stuff. Um, I only just started getting into hackathons recently. Uh, I thought that I wasn't a good enough programmer to do hackathons, if that makes sense. So uh, the place that I work for during the day, the actually a front end web developer for Zappos. They run their own uh, hackathons, I guess, that are done internally. And you get to kind of take a few days out to work with teams and create the features you think should be on the website or create the community project that you think should be kind of present downtown. So after doing a couple of them and actually being part of a couple of teams that won prizes, I realized that I wasn't as bad as I thought I was at this stuff. So I decided to start going to the, the public hackathons that were held in downtown Las Vegas. And the first one of that was just a general Vegas hack one, which was super fun. So yeah. yeah. So the the per what made you what made you come up with such a, a cool little idea? I know you said that you deal with some uh, stress issues and that might have <laughs> triggered it. Tell us a little bit more about that. And I don't know if you know this, but I actually posted your presentation on YouTube. So if you want to go see it, it's up there. Oh, I need to go see that because I, I ripped through it so fast. It was like thirty seconds. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, so originally, every time I think of attending a hackathon, I think, okay, so what cool technology do I want to use for this hackathon? And then can I come up with an idea that's compelling enough in order to be able to use that technology? So a lot of the time that's frowned upon, you know, it's like start with the idea and then figure it out. Don't start with the technology. But I find that that's kind of the most fun for me. So I wanted to use some of the really tiny kind of open source versions of the Arduino out there. And I thought, well, that's great because that suits wearable technology perfectly, and that was the theme of the AT&T hackathon. And so I wanted to make something that would go on my wrist and would monitor something, and I sort of thought, well, monitoring heartbeats and your pulse is still a relatively new thing. And I thought, how do I use that with the AT&T API? So it was really just starting to connect dots on what I was required to do and what I wanted to do. And I thought, the worst thing that I go through every day, which is probably a problem for other people, and this is where, I guess, coming up with the problem to solve comes in, right, is that often I don't realize I have anxiety or if I'm having a panic attack until it's too late and it's already happening. And because I suffer from both social anxiety as well as generalized anxiety, it kind of hits whenever it feels like, and it's completely irrational, right? So it's hard to manage. So I thought, what if what if there was a bracelet that you wore, it monitored your pulse, and as long as you weren't exercising too rigorously during the day, or if you took it off when you are at the gym, it would be able to sense that heartbeat, that pulse quickening, which is sort of just before you start feeling terrible, and it would SMS you a picture of a kitten to remind you that it's going to be okay, it's irrational, and this kitten will hopefully help you find a little bit of peace before it starts getting too crazy. <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. That's awesome. So I'm curious, did you... Um, know at a really young age that you were interested in IT and tech, or is this something that happened later? Tell just a little bit about your journey into technology altogether. So it's kind of started pretty young. Um, my family was a family that kind of ended up with the hand-me-down computers from friends and family. It was just the way that things were. And so the first computer I, I got, um, which was obviously belonging to all of us, was a Commodore 64, and you know I can see you smiling. I knew that you know everybody knows that computer. Yeah, that's and awesome. <laughs> I think most people were running Windows 95 or Windows 3.1 at the time. You know, it was pretty late. I think I was nine years old, so it was probably around 93, 94, right? Yeah, so pretty much Windows 3.1 days. So we were always a few years behind on each computer, which I think worked to my advantage because. You know, with the Commodore 64, there's no kind of GUI, there's no Windows server or anything like that. Um, and so I said to my dad, like, how do I program this? Like, what, how do I make it do things, right? And so he started me off. He was teaching me, you know, just general, you know, like programming, um, you know, pr like 
patterns and, and how to get started with it and just the general gist. And then he gave me the, the giant book that it comes with, you know. Um, and I just started from there. And after a while, I was programming sprites appearing on the screen that I could print out on the printer. And I guess that's kind of where it took off. So nine years old is kind of not hugely young, but I think it was a bit of an advantage for me because it kind of started an obsession that went all the way through to now. And I'm now... 20 years later, I'm almost 29, so. <laughs> That's awesome. That's very cool. Yeah, my um, my first experience with a computer was a uh, little Tandy. And <laughs> it was, it was the, the Tandy that you could actually, it kind of looked look like an 8-track cartridge that you put in the side of it and it right. your, your TV. That and is awesome. My and I, yeah, my dad and I sat there and tried to program like a little cannonball going across the, stream, the screen. It was, oh, kind of, it was kind of funny. So one of the things, um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Cooper uh, Harris. I did an interview with her um, about women in tech. One of the I things that... Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool, cool. Um, one of the things that she mentioned is uh, if we don't get... Uh, girls interested in a young age, you know, that's problematic. And one of the things that she was hit with is kind of the pink computer concept, the idea that, you know, girls are presented with, you know, uh, dolls and that kind of stuff when they're very young. And you starting at nine years old, it sounds like your family was always pretty supportive of, like, whatever you might be interested in. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with that. It's... I mean, there's, there's this whole belief system around gender, right? And it's that nature versus nurture and things like that. And I fall into the bucket of people that believe that gender is, like, the majority of gender as a concept is is a, a social construct. And so I think that um, the way we encourage women when they're children and the way that we kind of nurture them and, and encourage them in s different ways um, kind of helps put them on this path that they, they're not even aware they're on, they're not even aware that you've put them on, such as don't go play outside in the mud because you're wearing a pretty dress kind of, you know, thing, you know, it's that kind of stuff. So I honestly believe that, that um, you know, I had Barbie dolls and I had Lego and, you know, I had this huge kind of variety of stuff to play with. And, I mean, really I saw a TV advertisement for a an inkjet printer. It was like a Canon bubble jet or something. And... I just turned to my dad and I said, I want that. And he said, well, you need a computer and we don't have one, you know. And, and I was obsessed with this idea of printing out pictures. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering whether, you know, there are some boys that are just so not interested in that and they're more interested in sports, for example, or even just drawing or being an artist. And I think the same goes for women. You know, not all of us are going to be interested in it, but I'd honestly believe that we are put on a path where we are discouraged from pursuing something that is either challenging or is just doesn't fit into what our comfortable definition of gender brackets were. And my parents were always amazing about it. Whatever I was interested in, they're just like, cool, okay, let's help you have the tools in order to pursue that. So I was very lucky to have parents like that. That's awesome. So um, growing, I mean, starting at such a young age and growing up as someone that was interested in technology, was it difficult? Um, like in the school years and so forth, um, did it put you aside or make you feel kind of outside of the norm? How, how did that go? It did. I mean, there's a few experiences that I hopefully won't talk too long about. Um, the first one was I was the only girl in, um, this was when I was 15, I believe, in the electronics elective at school. So there were probably 20 students in two different classes. So out of 40 students, 39 were men, and I was the only girl. <laughs> so, you know, they were awkward about partnering up to do group activities together. And, I mean, obviously, I look around the room and I see no representations of anyone like myself, right? So that was interesting. The other side of it was that um, just in a general term, even without just putting gender into it, um, I would do things like spend birthday money that friends gave me on books on HTML and CSS, right? And they would get mad at me. They're like, why are you buying a book on that? You don't even have the internet at home, you know, because I would catch the bus to my local library and upload my website to tripod.com, you know, with my floppy disk. And they're just like, you're wasting my money that I gave you for your birthday, you know? And so people thought I was really strange because I was blogging and doing things like that before it was kind of recognized as even a career path, I guess.
for sure. For sure. Well, thank goodness for being strange. Tell us a little bit about um, about what you do. I'm a front end developer for um, Zappos.com um, during the day, so that's my sort of full-time stuff. But in my spare time, um, I kind of split it between a lot of different things. Um, the reason why I was late for this Hangout was because I had a board meeting. Um, I'm on the board for a hackerspace in Las Vegas, so I help do the marketing for that and, and the, the kind of the general operations. So I go to board meetings and boring things like that. But I mean, it's kind of fun to go to a board meeting for a hackerspace, though, when you think about it. Um, and I also do a lot of 3D printing. So I got into 3D printing in 2009 before most people were really kind of understood what it was, even though it's been around since the 80s. And I make a jewelry line um, that's 3D printed, so I don't know whether people can see, but that's a ring there. And that's one of my rings. Um, I have an Etsy shop on the side. Um, and I'm just, I'm kind of one of the 3D printing evangelists in Las Vegas. So I speak at a lot of um, tech, uh, tech career schools and uh, middle schools and high schools and universities about how awesome 3D printing is, how it's, you know, sparking industrial revolution and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, I tinker with my, my 3D printer at home, which is super fun. So that, that was why I brought my 3D printer to the hackathon, because I, I feel like it's this kind of extra limb that I take with me everywhere, so <laughs> that's kind of what I'm into right now, I guess, yeah. So, what do you think, as a, as a maybe as a society in general, or um, if you have specifics, what do you think we can do to encourage more women in the tech space? So, there's kind of a chicken and the egg thing here, right? It's, I don't know whether you can say it's chicken and egg or catch-22 where you need women to see themselves being represented in a field um, a lot of the time in order to help give that confidence that they belong somewhere and that they're capable. Um, you know, we, we, we look at system, systematic um, or systemic oppression in, in lots of different things such as race um, as well as gender. And if you don't see yourself represented, you can't see yourself actually wanting to strive for that, um, even if you're interested in it. So you assume as a result of, of whatever um, makes you fit into that minority that that's the reason why you don't belong there. But how do you get more women in if they don't feel confident enough to get in there, I guess? So um, what we need to do is for those women in the field who are actually comfortable with it, um, you know, they need to be speaking out and, and blogging and making themselves very kind of public and, and very approachable in order to help encourage that. Um, I like to do a lot of that stuff. I like to make sure that I'm present at tech events um, and things like that just to show that just because you don't see yourself represented doesn't mean that you can't try and, and make it in a, in a technology or a STEM field. So. Very cool, very cool. So um, do you know of any resources offhand like blogs or uh, any, any female-driven media that's out there now that you could, you could tell us about? So the weird thing is um, that most of my education and also most of kind of the activism that I'm either in involved in or like to kind of read about is actually on Tumblr, which sounds really weird. Um, but, you know, there's a, there's a huge demographic on Tumblr that is, is female as well, so it's, it's kind of a good platform to start with. But I follow a lot of kind of um, feminist Tumblrs um, online and as well as body positive and, and all sorts of different kind of social activism. That's been really good for me because they tend to pick out the really good articles. Um, there's also some really great people online on Twitter who I follow too. I should really send you a list because I, I don't know everyone off the top of my head but I'm more than happy to send a list. Um, and I find just um, things like the Ada Initiative, um, there's also one relating to Grace Hopper, where it's a scholarship to go and attend a conference, but also do boot camps. Um, things like Hacker School, um, things like the the Etsy Engineering Initiative, which you know strives to get that gender balance and and runs women um, coding conventions and things like that. Um, there's a wonderful woman in New York who runs uh, Girl Develop It. She kind of started it off. She is amazing, um, and just things like that. I mean, I. I would strongly recommend people find the women in tech meetups as well in their towns. So uh, we have Girls in Tech Las Vegas, which is run by Amber, Bradley, and Christina, and they're amazing. And just things, yeah, just like, things that. like that. 
Awesome. So you, you mentioned a term that I think it's unfortunate and possibly because of years past and the way the media took a hold of it, a lot of people think of it in the extreme, and it's the word feminist. So yes, yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to just brush over that. I would like you, if you could, to give your definition of what you what you envision when you say that word. Okay. So feminism to me is. I mean, it really is this very simple definition for me, um, and then it gets kind of more and more complicated from there. <laughs> so you know, really, at the end of the day, it's about women having access to the same rights the same privileges and the same um, the same kind of opportunities that um, that men are actually afforded you know and and take for granted every day that we don't always have access to and so you think about things like the vote and you know being able to own a house in your name without a male guarantor and you think of really kind of big things that were done for us um, in the past and you know, that was just the beginning. That were the things that you could make the biggest fuss about because you could honestly see that they were kind of the biggest forms of inequality, right? And now going forward, you know, we, we, we're starting to look at the more subtler things, the more subtle um, forms of misogyny in our society. And right now what's most relevant to me in feminism is that, trying to dismantle trying to dismantle really toxic spaces for women, such as online, where... Um, we're kind of treated pretty badly online in general and, you know, on online gaming communities, um, as well as just educating people of women's capabilities. I, I honestly believe that there's still this breakdown where people assume that if a woman does the same job as a man that she's just not as capable or she's not as deserving of um, promotions and achievements and, you know, she's not looked up to as much. And I think that that's important, as well as getting intersectionality into things. So, for example, a white female such as myself has a completely different experience within feminism and then within um, misogyny that a, a black woman does, for example. You know, and trying to recognize the differences and trying to help each other out and dismantle it, rather than, you know, having it become the oppression Olympics. So feminism to me right now is trying to recognize that we all have different experiences and that feminism is meant to cover um, all of those experiences and help get opportunities for all women to, to actually finally get towards equality, hopefully soon. <laughs> I love that. That's excellent. That's awesome. Um, it's funny uh, because I, and I don't remember the name of the study, um, but when I did my interview with the gentleman from Ericsson, um, he sent me a link to a study that actually showed um, some interesting information on group dynamics and the overall IQ of a group. Uh, what's interesting is he started out believing that the IQ of a group would be the average of the IQ of the individuals, and that wasn't the case. He further showed um, that when you added females to the group, the group IQ actually increased when you did That's that. That's amazing. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. That's so bizarre too. When you try and bend your logic, that. <laughs> there was also a study. Um, I think they've done this numerous times actually, where they will give a, they will give the um, subjects like a paper, and you need to kind of grade the, the the paper, and it'll be just like thorough research on a specific topic, or it could be a thesis. And what they'll do is that they will give two different groups the same paper, but they'll actually change the name on the top as to who was the author. So they'll have a very kind of generically female name, such as Jane Doe, and then they'll have James Smith, for example. And the groups overall will rate the paper more highly if they think that a man wrote it. And, and so you kind of see that direct bias happening over and over again. Um, but then things like that IQ stuff proves otherwise completely. You know what I mean? It's it's kind of crazy, and it's those kind of biases, those really subtle biases that I believe are kind of should be our focus from now on because they're the things that that you know people get away with the most, and they're actually the most unaware that they're doing it as well. And so helping to dismantle that and helping people critically think about the way that they see the world is kind of important in in just getting rid of that last kind of attitudes that that are hanging around, you know. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So you mentioned that um, women are 
not treated very kindly online. I know you mentioned dating. I, I kind of get that. I understand where, you know, I can I can envision where that would go. But is it beyond that? And what what did you mean by? I guess um, what they've done is they've looked at um, activities online, and they've found that. Well, there are a lot of men comment that they get a lot of nasty comments on blog posts or, or Twitter kind of articles or anything that, that they post, they'll get negative reactions on, particularly if it's political, right? Um, but then they've studied that and they've just seen, like, an, there's an exponential number of, of um, threats and harassment and awful comments um, that women receive, even if they write on similar subjects, right? So... It's true that everyone online is subject and vulnerable to kind of, you know, trolls and anonymous people who think that, you know, it's an awesome thing to death threat people and harass them and do things like that. But women do actually suffer from, you know, an exponential amount of that stuff. Um, and, you know, I have, I have um, girlfriends who play online on, on, say, you know, Xbox Live servers and things like that. And if the groups find out she's female, so they'll either kick her out of that, that game that they're multiplayering on, or they will start um, being sexually suggestive and sexually harassing her to the point where she doesn't want to be playing the game anymore. And so, you know, things that are kind of seen as, oh, that's just boys being boys, is, is very much accepted online. And just because it's been a thing that's happened, a lot of people tell me, well, that's how the world works, that's how the internet works. But that's not really, you know, the acceptance that we should be having because um, I don't know whether you've been following the Anita Sarkeesian kind of stuff where Anita Sarkeesian is a critical game reviewer. She looks at tropes, particularly female tropes in video games, and she criticizes them. And all she does is just criticize them. She's not trying to take anyone's games away. And she has had her Wikipedia page defiled with really awful pictures of herself that have been photoshopped. Uh, someone created a game where you could beat her up and, you know, it would photoshop her face so that she was cut and bloodied and all sorts of things like that. And all she did was just say, hi, you know, games are kind of harmful to, um, you know, society's image of women and this is why. And she's just had the most unbelievable amount of awful treatment directed at her. You know, for does not deserve that at all. So I guess they're the kind of things that we see. You know, it's interesting. It, it, it almost seems to me like it, it speaks to, it kind of speaks to our society as a whole. Um, I know when I, when, when I was growing up, and I don't know if people know this term now, but my dad would always say, look, you need to have couth in everything that you do. And basically what he meant by that is, regardless of who you're dealing with, Treat them with respect. Um, so I understand. I understand the concept of boys will be boys, but when that falls outside of respecting another human being, I, I don't think that's. I mean, humans need to be humans, regardless. You know what I'm saying? I completely understand what you're saying. Yeah, I believe that. I think. Um, I think a lot of the kind of opportunity on the internet, especially online, um, comes from the fact that you can be anonymous, right? And so. You know, I've seen artists do do kind of um, public art artworks where they are actually the artwork, and people can do whatever they want to that artist without consequence. And you know, they'll do awful things to that person standing in the public space. And then, as soon as the artwork is over and they reanimate, um, everybody runs away because they realize that all of a sudden they're accountable for those actions. And I think that. Removing accountability kind of shows, as a society, what we're willing to accept if we can't pin it on somebody and um, and have them actually suffer consequences as a result. So I think that that's a little scary. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. So now, and my point of view, just personally, is that I feel that accountability should come from society and not necessarily always from from controlling governments. Mm -hmm. um, how, what would your suggestion be on how we hold each other accountable, or is that even possible? It's, it's going to be a lot of hard work, right? I mean, I, I think that what you said about boys will be boys, and what your, your father said was very 
profound as far as this goes because that really is how you should be treating people and we shouldn't be giving people excuses based on loose constructs of like what that person should represent in society, right, such as boys will be boys. I think the thing is that when you have things like freedom of speech, particularly in America, freedom of speech is something that I can, I, I understand it's completely valuable um, and we should have it. However, people mistake freedom for freedom of speech for um, being able to say and do what you like without actually having anyone be critical of what you've said and also not being accountable for it. So if you've done something ex incredibly harmful, particularly to a minority or someone who is vulnerable, um, and I mean kicking someone when they're down, I guess you could say, that person should be accountable, that person should absolutely be criticized. and. Um, I think that whatever you say, you should actually be welcome to that too because learning how to treat people better isn't something you should take personally. If someone calls you out for something, that's an opportunity for you to educate yourself and, and actually become a better person. And I think wanting to be a better person shouldn't be the result of a religion or a government law that's put in place. Um, it should be how you feel as a person and knowing that the better we are to each other, um, the the better that community and society will actually develop like economically and you know otherwise as well you know it's it's all completely wrapped together but people try and segment it down to the little separate items yeah totally totally so uh, just kind of going moving to um, back to just the women in tech concept um, if I'm a if I'm a woman trying to get into tech or I'm kind of involved in tech but not to a great extent, I'm kind of nervous about that, what advice would you give me to, to help me become more comfortable in that space? So the first thing I would recommend is do a scout in, around your area, either on Yelp or meetup.com, to try and find women-friendly events. There's usually going to be at least kind of one women in engineering meetup in your city. Um, if there isn't one, then think about starting one or, you know, hopefully one will start up soon. The other side of that is to find yourself a mentor. Find yourself um, a mentor who's a woman who is who you look up to is already um, being successful in the field that you want to pursue in STEM um, or tech and lean on them and learn from their experiences um, and also get them to set goals with you so that if you want to if you want to have the courage, for example, to go to a hackathon, that is a completely legitimate goal and it is legitimately terrifying to go to your first one if you're not feeling confident, right? So having a mentor who believes in you um, and having someone to look up to that represents you um, is probably the most important thing that I can recommend for sure. Um, I had that in high school with a my media studies teacher. It started there and um, I continually try and find mentors that I look up to to hang out with. That's excellent. That's great advice. Very cool. Okay, thank you again, and have an awesome rest of your weekend. And thank if there's you. anything that you need or any way that I can be a support to you or the things that you're doing, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so thank much. You, this is a really great start. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, Susan. Bye. Bye.